Hi, welcome to Exploring the Illusion of Free Will. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number 136, Free Will and the Problem with Philosophy. Okay, I'm taping this on Thursday, August 29th, 2013. Um, this is going to be like, you know, the problem is that this question of whether we have a free will has been in the domain of philosophy for hundreds of years, and... You know, philosophers, you have to conclude, are perhaps good at learning what, what earlier philosophers had said and written and thought and repeating that. But, you know, any kind of a cursory examination of this issue of free will, which incidentally is the most written about, most discussed topic in, free, in philosophy, will just lead you to conclude that modern philosophers, as well as many even historic um, earlier philosophers, are not very good at thinking, or, or, or not, their, their logic is not very strong. In other words, they're very good at, at learning, you know, what has been said, why and all, and repeating that, teaching that, writing about it, but they're just not, and that is, that is fundamentally the problem with philosophy. We'll get into that, you know, after, you know, our intro. So before we get into that, um, I want to do what I always do in each show, to just basically define, you know, what people mean when they say they have a free will, and why this free will is absolutely impossible. I want to refute it briefly, and then just like describe why this issue is so, so fundamentally, so world-changingly important. Okay, um, so basically, when people say that we have a free will, what they're saying is that our thoughts, actions, feelings, sometimes not feelings, it depends on, but basically what we do, you know, and. Is, is basically up to us, okay? In other words, like, nothing that's not in our control, and control is the key, okay? Let me repeat this. Control is the key. Um, if something that we're not in control of is either taking part in the decision or making the decision for us, compelling us to make the decision, that's not a free will. Um, I want to just talk briefly about the issue of, of um, a factor that's partly in control. In other words, like, if I'm holding up this paper with this right hand, okay, I could say that, the, you know, this right hand is holding it up, you know, um, completely on its own, okay? And let's say this right hand is, represents free, quote-unquote, free will. I mean, I know it's impossible, whatever. Now, all of a sudden, if I hold it with both hands, okay, we can no longer say that this right hand of its own free will, whatever, in this example, is holding up the paper because something else, this external factor that's not that this right hand is, is not in control of is taking part in it so that's why I say that like if something outside of our control is either making us make the decision which, which is actually technically the most precise way of describing this or even taking part in the decision as I just described you know through this example then we we couldn't we cannot have a free will um, another way people like to say that like we have a free will because we could have chosen otherwise. People say that, you know, but, but think about it. Um, well, before I refute that, basically, the, the basic reason we don't have a free will is because of causality, okay? Everything has a cause. And for, for people who say that some things don't have a cause, that makes things worse for free will because if our decisions, our actions are not caused, then our, they're certainly not caused by our free will, you know, or by our will or by us or by anything. If they're uncaused, they're uncaused. Okay, but basically, so like if you, if you leave that aside, you're left with everything has a cause. And so that what happens is like if we make a decision, if we do anything we do, you know, move a hand or whatever, there's going to be a cause to that decision. And if everything has a cause, there's going to be a cause to the cause of that decision. Okay, and then there's going to be a cause to the cause of the cause of that decision. Okay, so you have this, this chain of cause and effect going and it, it goes back in time. So they're like... The cause of the decision precedes the decision. The cause of that cause precedes that cause. And the cause of that cause precedes that cause. And so you have this chain of cause and causal antecedents that begin regressing back in time and ultimately leads to, as far as we know, the Big Bang. All right, so that's, that's the fundamental reason we don't have free will. Okay, so, um, so why is this important? So, and and that's, that's what people mean. Another thing, like... People sometimes say that if we have free will, we're fundamentally morally responsible, okay? And, and their m major mistake with this is they, 
they presume, they wrongly conclude that because we have a tendency to hold ourselves responsible, because we have laws and we, because we have religious precepts and all, that, that render us personally accountable fundamentally, because of that, then that must mean we have free will. That's, that's arguing from desire. That's arguing from a premise you know, that, 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 that isn't um, demonstrated. So another, it's, it's arguing, all right, so like, so in, in that case, um, okay, in that case, what happens is like, if, for example, if the Big Bang through this causal process is resulting in everything we do, then obviously we're not fundamentally morally, let's say everything we do morally, like whatever we do right, it's a result of this causal, you know, progression, this cause and effect chain, the start of the Big Bang, or per perhaps before. So if every moral decision we make, if every good thing we do is, is the, the causal result of that, and every bad thing we do is the causal result of that, fine, there may still be morality, but it's not our morality. It's not our personal morality. It's the morality of the universe. Or if you want to like describe this from a theological standpoint, it's the mor morality of God. All right. So that's so that's why that's you know that's basically what people mean when they say we have a free will, and that's also why we don't have a free will. We'll we'll do more of that you know later. Why is this important? I will just like I'll refer to this guy that I like to bring up a lot in these shows. His name is John Searle. He's a philosopher. In 2010, they did a survey of who among philosophers who were born after 1900 had been most cited by other philosophers in their, their work. That's one way in academia that they rank the relative importance of various academians. You know, like they, they publish these papers and these papers, these books are cited by other academians in their work. So like, so in this 2010 survey, this guy John Searles, an American philosopher, he was ranked number 13. Okay, so like that just gives you a, you know, some indication of his stature in the field. Okay, he was like this, this um, British psychologist, Susan Blackmore, um, was preparing for a book that she published in 2005 called Conversations on Consciousness. She interviewed John Searle, and in that interview she said like, well, you know, if the world were to come to acknowledge and accept and integrate, you know, just simply acknowledge and accept and understand the free will's illusion, what would that mean, you know? And Searle said, you know, I'm, I'm quoting almost directly, that would be a bigger revolution in our thinking than Einstein or Copernicus or Newton or Galileo or Darwin. It would alter our whole conception of our relation with the universe. Okay, this, this overcoming of free will is the biggest thing that humanity has ever discovered. You know, it's like we discovered one, you know, that the world isn't flat, that we're an orb, fine, but that doesn't, that doesn't really change much, you know, unless we're going to fly to the moon and back. We've, we've discovered that, like, that, you know, our world, um, that the sun, for example, doesn't revolve around us. We revolve around the sun. We've had these major discoveries, but this is different because, like, this is like a discovery that, that goes to the heart of who we are as human beings. In other words, we're, we're not these free agents. We can't do whatever we want. We're, we're more accurately described as puppets, robots, actors, you know, and like fulfilling the will of what? Fulfilling the will of either God or the universe or the Big Bang, whatever you want to call it. But basically that's, you know, like going from our world, you know, everyone going from believing that what we do is up to us to understanding that absolutely nothing is up to us, nothing has ever been up to us or can ever be up, be up to us, that is the biggest revolution in science that, that, um, that, that has happened today. And, you know, I was going to say that I can think of, there's a few other developments that if they were to happen, I think they would be greater than this. For example, if we found a way, either through some kind of a medicinal agent or some kind of technique, to make everyone completely happy or supremely happy, you know, blissed out, that I think would, would be a bigger accomplishment. If, if we were to find out what happens for sure, without any doubt, what happens after we die, you know, if anything, whatever, that I think would be a bigger accomplishment. If maybe if, if we were to, to communicate, to, to like interact with aliens, that might be a bigger accomplishment. I'm, I'm not sure. 
But again, but these things haven't happened. So this, 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 you know, our world awakening from this, this like massive delusion that we have a free will to the understanding that absolutely nothing is up to us, and then the implications of what that means. In other, in other words, like, you know, fine, we don't have a free will, so like we make a lot of mistakes. Why is the universe making us make these mistakes? Why is the universe making us make these mistakes, and then causing us to either blame others and punish them, or blame ourselves and punish ourselves, or have others blame us and punish punish us? You know, like it. To my thinking, it doesn't make sense that the universe would want to do that because, like, in a certain perspective, the universe is kind of like doing it to itself. It's, it's like hurting itself by doing that. But All right, that's another en entirely different issue, but I hope you get an understanding of wh why this is the biggest thing ever, why, why, you know, this is the biggest revolution in our thinking that has ever taken place. Okay, um, so now let's, let's get into our topic. Okay, now the problem... The pro free will and the problem with philosophy. The, the basic problem in philosophy, there's several, is that, um, okay, um, in, in science, in science you, you've got evidence like causality, the causal process, you've got like, an, you've got like countless experiments that you, you, you see a cause and then you see an effect. I mean, that's, that's the way science works. And, and as a matter of fact, the scientific method relies on causality to determine scientific truth, you know, if you, if you want to call it that. In other words, like, it'll do an experiment, and it'll, you'll have a certain cause creating a certain effect. And to verify that, it, you, that you haven't made any, mis any mistakes, you'll do the same experiment over and over and over and over. And that will determine the truth of what we know about whatever phenomenon we're studying. All right. So science is very rigorous. It has these these kinds of like, you know, conditions for 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 ascertaining truth. For for you know, the, it's based on evidence, empirical evidence. Um, philosophy isn't like that. Philosophy in philosophy, some philosophers will actually say that that some things are just not caused. I mean, like. You know, again, like I've explained in other shows that even if even if you were tr to try to refute determinism or causality by saying that certain things have not been found to have a cause, like in quantum mechanics, some people say that that's not going to help free will. Okay, but more so than that, because like you know, because like if if our decisions, our actions are not caused, we can't attribute them to ourselves. We can't attribute them to our uh, to a free will. But but more so than that, conceptually, you know, as, as a concept, logically, um, what does it mean for something to not be caused? I mean, things don't just like happen for no reason, for no cause. But in philosophy, because it's not really rigorous, because like basically you can like say whatever you want, and you, you can't really test it, or whatever, or you, they don't have to test it. You know, you get these very unscientific claims. You know gaining a level of very, very unwarranted um, acceptability or just, you know, acceptance, whatever. Uh, so, so, like, so again, like, w with philosophy, here's, all right, the essential problem with philosophy as it relates to free will is that the free will question is extremely, extremely simple. It's very fundamentally simple, and, and so I'll explain it right now. Um, if everything is causal. If everything has a cause, that makes free will impossible because as I explained before, anything we do is going to have a cause. That cause is going to have a cause and these causes are going to regress back in time, moment by moment, you know, to the Big Bang or whatever. So, you know, so act, you know, we can't, we can't be fundamentally responsible. We can't be, um, we can't attribute to ourselves any action that is a complete result of this causal chain that preceded our birth. You know, again, so it, go, it goes back to before our birth, before the planet was created, presumably to the Big Bang and before. Okay, so like, so this is simple logic. Fine. Causality refutes free will. Some people will, and we, we might as well go with some, some big philosophers, Kant, Hume, they didn't like the fact that we don't have free will, so what do they do? They changed the meaning of the word. You know, Spinoza before them, you know, many philosophers before them had delineated, had described what the debate was about. But Kant and Hume and a few others didn't like that. They couldn't accept that we don't have free will. So they said, well, no, no, free will doesn't mean what they say it means. <laughs> free will is like when I have the will 
that I want to have. Absurd definition. <laughs> I got to take a drink. It's an absurd definition, and it's even, it's even refutable. Because even with that definition, causality refutes it. Because, like, <clears throat> if you're saying, like, free will is when, when I have the decision I want, make the decision I want, then you still have you're left with the question, well, what made you make it? You know, you still have this causal thing. So anyway, so like, so basically getting back to this, this simple logic of why free will is impossible, aside from these straw man, you know, arguments that, that, that argue about something that isn't in, in contention, you know, again, it's not like whether we want to decide what we want, you know, I mean, it's actually what, what's causing us to decide and all. So aside from that, so causality makes free will impossible, okay? If you try to refute causality, you're left with three conceptual options. A causality, or things happening without a cause, and you, you just think of that, about that for, for a moment, and you, you, you conclude that makes things even worse for free will, okay? Because like, if things are without a cause, you can't ascribe them to human beings. A, a second alternative to causality is that things happen, causa sui is the term, it's a Latin term, it's like, they, things self-cause, you know, our decisions are the cause of themselves, okay? But even with that, if our decisions are causing themselves, we're not causing them. Our free will, our will isn't causing them, okay? So, and, and the last conceptual or alternative to determinism or causality, they're very interchangeable. Determinism re is really causality as it relates to prediction. You know, that confuses a lot of people. So anyway, the, the third alternative to that is things happening ex nihilo or something coming from nothing. In other words, like, we just like decide, you know, it's just like the decision just happens. It, it's, it's, not, it's another example of it happening without a cause. It just emerges from nothing. But again, if, if it just emerges from nothing, it's not emerging from our will. And, you know, obviously if it's not emerging from our will, it's not emerging from our free will. All right, so that's the thing. The logic of this issue is so fundamentally simple and that, that is the problem with philosophy because like so many philosophers can't accept this, so they, what do they do? They obfuscate like, like, um, like so many have done. They, 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 they resort to sophistry. They resort to these, these, these word things. Like for example, they, they say that free will is like that we, can, we could have chosen to do otherwise. Okay, and then they don't realize that if we would have done otherwise, that other decision would have had a causal history that spans back to before we were born. All right, so so basically, the 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 state the state of philosophy today it's it's like it's immature, it's unprofessional, and it's a lot of just like confusion. You're, there's a lot of people in philosophy today, and I'm not going to name them because they have careers and stuff. I don't want to like you know, I'd rather not get personal with this. But they're arguing from reason. You know, they don't have the the, the evidence. They don't have the logic. So they, 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 they try to like obfuscate. Some of, some of them are very good at this. And they just like, they either come up with straw man arguments or they're arguing from desire. They say like, you know, life, life would have no meaning if we didn't have a free will, which is not accurate, but that's what they believe. So because they believe that, they say we have to have free will because life has to have meaning. No, I'm sorry. I mean, I think life still has meaning. It's not our meaning, but, but you can't like, you can't base a conclusion, a philosophical conclusion, on a desire that you have based on what, what you believe life should, ha should be. Okay, and then, then they have these convoluted arguments that miss the point in, in, entirely. Like, one of them is called Burdan's, I think Burdan's ass, like this donkey or something, that is equidistant between two bales of hay, and it can't decide between the two. And somehow, that I've never been able to understand, they assert, that's an example of why we have free will. No, I'm sorry. That's an example. Ultimately, that, that ass, that animal is going to, you know, if it decides, if it doesn't ever decide, fine. It hasn't made a decision. That's not free will. And maybe, maybe not making a decision is a decision, you know, to act or not act. So there's going to be a cause to that. So again, with, with these kinds of like examples that they, can't, they come up with, they don't subject them to the, um, to the causality, a causality and stuff, the proofs. And so like, all right. So... Um, so why, I mean, the problem with philosophy is this, this question has been settled logically, it's been settled scientifically decades, if not centuries ago, okay? 
Um, so why, why are they still debating about it? This is the big question. Okay. My, you know, and I can only conjecture on this. Um, these philosophers are, for the most part, tied to academic institutions, colleges, universities. And colleges and universities gain a significant, perhaps sometimes very substantial, portion of their revenues to operate from donations, from contributions from their alumni who, who maybe want their kids to go to that college and all. So basically, we live in a culture that, that basically believes in free will, okay? I mean, for, for religion, it's like a fundamental principle, fundamental precept, okay? So like, I think a lot of these, um, you know, colleges maybe um, are afraid to, to, um, to offend their donors. They're, they're, they're afraid that like, if, if they start teaching kids that we have no free will, then the, the donors might, um, might object or whatever. I mean, that's not how you do science. I mean, that, like, certainly that, that didn't happen with evolution. I mean, you know, with evolution, the, the evidence was compelling that, that, you know, that we evolved from lower life forms. And so, like, you know, the, the colleges continue to exist. So, like, I think that shouldn't be a problem, okay? Another, um, another major problem in philosophy is even though this is the most um, talked about, most discussed, most written about topic in philosophy, you don't see very many books on it. You see some books, again, very, very few are published each year, and extremely few. Um, over the last, well, you want to know something. I, 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 I published a book called Exploring the Illusion of Free Will, second edition. I published it on Kindle and um, CreateSpace. I self-published it just recently, a few months ago or so, and I listed... 20 books that pretty unequivocally refute free will. And that's pretty much all that I'd been able to find. In, in other words, there, there's articles that, that refute free will, but, but in terms of books, there's very, very few. All right, so like for, for, the, uh, for the most discussed, most popular topic in, in philosophy, one, that they get it wrong, two, that there's so few people publishing refutations on free will will tell you a great deal about the the um the state of philosophy and not just in the united states but in, in the entire world so um so another problem with philosophers is like these books that they tend to write about the issue they don't write it toward the lay public they write it toward themselves and they write it with this kind of like obfuscative um nomenclature you know indeterminism determinism um incompatibilist compatibilist um, hard determinism, soft determinism. It's, it's kind of a code. It, it kind of like, I think it makes them feel like that, like, in other words, if, if common people are not, um, you know, are led to, to believe that it's a complicated subject, then it serves the professional philosopher's interest, that, that, that they have, they're privy to, to certain uh, understanding that, that, that uh, evades other people, but that's, I mean, like, this, this topic, this question of free will is so fundamental, so simple, as I described before, that all of that, you know, all of that confusing, obfuscative terminology they come up with is just sophistry. It's just, it's just like, it's trying to, like, you know, not through logic, but through, through artifice, through, through, um, <laughs> through deceit to, to kind of, like, win a point. Okay, um, so yeah, <clears throat> I think we have to conclude that these, these philosophers, they're good at learning, and they're good at remembering what they learned, and they're good at reciting or rewriting what they learned, redescribing it, but they're not good at thinking, because if they were good at thinking, this problem would have been solved long, long ago. Okay, so now what's new? What we can expect? We can expect that since like the, the early 80s when Benjamin Labette, a psychologist, neuroscientist, came up with evidence, hard empirical evidence, that our unconscious is actually activated to make certain decisions before we're consciously aware that we, we've made them. You know, you know, since that kind of evidence has come, since there's been evidence in psychology that we can prime a person to do a certain behavior, and then we ask them, why did you do the behavior? And they'll tell us a reason that has no relation to the priming that they've just, just undergone. So basically the idea is like, this issue is moving from philosophy that has no rules, and you can say whatever you want, you're not hold, held accountable because, because that's the way philosophy is, to the sciences, to psychology, to neuroscience, to physics, you know? So basically as, as this happens, 
then um, in the sciences, in the rigorous sciences like physics, it's much harder to get away with this kind of sophistry, this kind of like, you know, just muddying the water, you know, in an attempt to kind of like win a point, not, not, not according to any moral means, just according to your desire to win, whatever. Okay, so like another major development in this is the internet. Okay, like, you know, before it was in the it was in academia and they wanted to keep it there. They had no desire to like get it out into mainstream. And so now with the internet, <coughs> there's like there's a lot of material. Again, I I survey the YouTube videos pretty regularly for for new information. Some websites, it's getting more and more out there, and people like all over the world are. are coming to understand this. The last major development that's taking this issue away from philosophy and actually it's bringing it to, theolo to theology to a certain extent is that um, a lot of now atheists, people who don't believe there is a God or who, who, who are agnostic, who, who just, you know, according to their definition of God, um, as, assert that, 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 that there's no evidence, whatever, they've begun to take this, um, take on this issue and like people like Sam Harris who's a neuroscientist, he happens to be an atheist, he's also a three-time New York Times best-selling author. In 2012, he published a book called Free Will that refutes it, you know, and so like, so basically it's getting out there, and again, with the internet, you can see this show, this show's on the internet, there's 136 episodes up there so far, once I get this one up there. It's getting out there, so all right, so the problem with philosophy is like, one, you know, it's kind of like a, a field without rigorous rules. Two, the, the philosophers just are not good thinkers. They're good learners. They're good reciters of what they learn. They're just not good thinkers because this, this question is too easy for them to be good thinkers and not figure it out. Um, and third is that they didn't bring it out to, to the world and to science that's happening now. All right, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching. And, you know, we're just going to keep doing shows. Um, I've got a show in Manhattan until people get that free will is completely po impossible and we'll create a much, much better world through this understanding. Okay, thanks for watching.